Robert Duvall is one of America's most admired actors. His career started after college and a stint in the Army when he came to New York and enrolled in the neighborhood playhouse. In stage productions, Duvall gained a reputation as an up-and-coming, and he was soon cast in his first film, To Kill a Mockingbird. He has worked steadily ever since. His memorable performances are in films like The Godfather, Apocalypse Now, The Great Santini, and Tender Mercies. His most recent film, A Fam Family Thing, is a project very close to him. Not only does he star in it with James Earl Jones, but he came up with the film's idea, and he produced it, and we're pleased to have him here this evening. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Great to have you. Was your father a military man? Yeah, he was. Admiral? Well, he was, he was a retired rear admiral. He was active rank. He was a captain, yeah. He went to the Naval Academy when he was 16. Yeah. And graduated in 1924. From, he was off the farm from Northern Virginia. So you lived in a lot of places, I bet. Yeah, we did. We moved around. Yeah. We were pretty transient. You ended up in Principia College? Yeah, in Southern Illinois. A small yeah. college that had a terrific little drama department. Just yeah. wonderful. Is that what got you bitten by the acting bug? Yeah, well, my parents kind of shoved me, pushed me into it. <laughs> they my said, mother, well, you're, yes, not a, you're not going to be a mathematician or well, you're I not going to be things, a nuclear uh, physicist? Maybe yeah, acting right. is good. It was kind of, I took physics for eight days. <laughs> it was kind of an expedient <laughs> thing to get me through school at the end of the Korean War to kind of like... Uh, yeah gracefully get me through uh, school academically and I, then I began to really like it you know but they were the ones that what did you like about it I, I just kind of liked something that I s suddenly could kind of do well and I started getting a few A's in yeah. school and the first production was the story of two Perros by Bill Snyder a wonderful young writer from uh, uh, he's he since uh, teaches in uh, southwestern Tennessee it was a full-length mime play the story of two Perros where I played a Harlequin clown it was wonderful and the man who chore uh, cho choreographed it and directed it, uh, Frank Parker at Principia College, he had been a dancer with Pavlova. And, it yeah. was a, and then the Pomerans who ran the Gateway Summer Theater yeah. in Bellport, Long Island. Yeah. <coughs> they went to that school. It was a, just a small uh, group of people. That, uh, but it was yeah. Bobby Morse had gone there and Ricky Morse. It's wonderful. So it was a wonderful little uh, department. Speaking of the Gateway, which is still there in Bellport, you did a view from the bridge there. Yeah, yeah. first when Ulu, I first met Ulu Grosbart. Yeah, and we later did it off Broadway. Yeah. for, you know, on a commercial, uh, 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 in a commercial run. What made you a star? What movie made you a star? I don't know. I think it was a gradual thing, maybe. Yeah. I'm not sure. I think, I think that I had a nice, I had, I had a nice career of, 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 of various jobs, theater and movies, television. And on this track, I, I had uh, uh, just the Horton Foot projects. Yeah. Starting with The Killing Mockingbird, Tomorrow, uh, The Chase, uh, Tender Mercies, Convicts. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Horton's a wonderful writer. Had I never had another career, that would have been a wonderful career, but then I had this career. And I think what made it was a catalyst to put us all into what you might call somewhat of stardom was The Godfather. Yeah. That was, although I'd done stuff before, that would kind of propel. Guys, their careers went to a more obvious w way than mine did. I've always been kind of a late bloomer. Now I'm kind of reaping the benefits of those earlier years more because it seemed to me more parts are coming my way yeah, now how does that more than ever. Because what you, why is that? I don't know. Just that maybe it's my time. It's my time. It's better to come later than earlier, probably. Yeah, earlier I had a good career, too, but yeah. it, it, it doesn't seem to diminish as I get older. And it doesn't, like, uh, uh, I, I feel more confident. And, 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 and I always try to be diverse, always have been. And I always t told Sanford Meisner when I worked with him at the Neighborhood Play, I said I always would try to think of myself in the potential, always in the potential state. So I, until I wrap it up, you know, I always look for new things. And, and, and fortunately, a lot of new different things come my way, diverse things. Does a time come when you're on that track, when you're in the players, when you're at Sanford Meisner, and, and a lot of people were there. Hackman was there. Well, no, they, they, no, they were they different. Were... Actually, I actually met them. They weren't, uh, actually, uh, uh, they were at the Pasadena Playhouse. I knew Gene in, in New York. We would look for jobs together, and he said, this yeah. guy's going to come with a shock of black hair and sleep on my floor. It was Dustin Hoffman. <laughs> but we all met in New York. But actually... Uh, you didn't actually, study this, uh, together? No, not, not, not so much. We, we went over with Lonnie Chapman for a while. Dusty and I did. But I started out with Sanford Meisner, which was like fear and trembling. You know, it's like, ah. But, yeah. uh, Is that guys, where you learned to act? Well, it helped. I think I, I, I did summer theater before that. You know, I, I learned certain things from Sanford. But I think, I think, I think a certain thing, you know, uh, character acting, I, think that, I don't think that can be taught. Uh, which, which was stressed over there, which was good, the uh, improvisation, the moment-to-moment -moment work, which I think is so important, within the form even. And I think people that left and graduated from Sanford Meisner, some of them lose that. But the, basically what he taught, and others do too, I'm sure, was within the form of any given text. There's always that ability to improvise within the form and let it go a different way each night or on stage or in film. You know, take two, take three, you can go a different way and, be, and feel free and relaxed enough to let it go. 
a different way, a spontaneous way within the form. Francis. Cold Working Cold. with Francis, yeah. yeah. Good, good. It was great. It yeah. was good? Yeah. See, when I first worked with Francis, it was in the, it was in the, the rain people. Yeah. Because I think Rip Torn had been in that, and something happened. They, he part, they parted ways, and I came in with Jimmy Conn, who I, it was great to work with. And after that, we all tried out for The Godfather. And I, he was always a, a distant. I didn't quite get it with Francis. He was always kind of dark. And I want to write a book someday called The Russians Are Great, because all directors come out of the Russia saying how great it is. But <laughs> Francis would come out forlorn looking. He, he, he was <laughs> we didn't always, get it. He was it's always all... searching, which, you know. Yeah. And so when we did Godfather 1, I, he still felt like a stranger to me. But I gained a lot of respect for him, a lot of respect, because there was a standby, understudied director following him around on the set in case they had to fire him. He would take over. And the, and the first AD was the, this understudied director's best friend. So he really had to work, work under the gun with the, you know, the, the powers that be in Hollywood, Coppola. And I, and I gained a lot of respect for Bob him. Bob Evans at that time. Yeah, right? that, that, you know, and, 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 you know, a lot of people take credit, but that film could have been made in Disney. It could have been made in that studio down in Wilmington, North Carolina, yeah, any right. place as long as right. Francis was directing. It was his film. I don't care what anybody says. Do you think it's an American classic? Yeah, I do. Those first two, I mean, you know, I mean, that, that's really fine filmmaking. Wonderful film. What like made it that? The acting, the story? I don't know. It's the, just kind of the idea in the middle of that a, this was a story about America and this was a story about larger than just gangsters. Yeah, I, think it, I think it was a bit romanticized. Somebody said when they read the book, they turned the last page to look for an application to join them up. You know, <laughs> Mario it, it's a little, it but still, it's wonderful filmmaking. And uh, I just think it was a, a, a mixture of things. At one point, Jimmy Kahn said to Francis, what, what do we mean? You take all the credit. You don't think we had something to do with it? You know? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty outspoken. <laughs> but uh, I think that uh, during, during the making of Godfather 1, you know, yeah. from our point of view, maybe eternity-wise, it doesn't mean that much, but I felt we were, we were in something very special that was going to yeah. do well. And be Pacino important. was a big risk for him. Big what? A risk for Francis. Well, yeah, they, they put him in the, the gang who couldn't shoot straight. Yeah. And, they, and then they got him back, and it was a whole thing, and uh, it was kind of, but, you know, he was, uh, I can't think of anybody who could play that part better, except if Travolta was now, then, bop, bop, the yeah. last thing he did, he can play that well. Yeah, you this know, thing, but, I saw this bad, the way he plays a bad guy. Yeah, the thing was, uh, uh, Get Shorty. Yeah, Terrific. Oh, Get Shorty's great, oh, yeah, I was doing something else he's done. He should have won the Get Oscar. Shorty. He should have won the Oscar. Up. He wasn't even up. Yeah. yeah. But you think he should have won. Best yeah. actor should have yeah. been in 1996. Certainly well, right up there. Yeah, Why he, didn't he get nominated? Uh, who knows? Who knows? The politics of Hollywood. Why did the other guy, the guy that did uh, Othello, uh, Lawrence Fishburne, was excellent. Didn't get nominated either. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, that's whatever. Why didn't you do Godfather 3? Well, they, they said a lot of things about that, but uh, it boiled down to the fact that let's, let's everybody admit they were doing it for money. Why wait 20 years to do Godfather? Francis, well, they were doing it for money. I said, I don't mind taking half of what Pacino gets or whatever. Don't offer me like a fourth of what he gets or what others get. You know, let's, let's, let's be equal about this. And they wouldn't, so I said, I pass. He came to my farm in Virginia, parked his car, came in, I sat him down in, in the kitchen. He always wanted my mother's Maryland crab cake recipe. I said, I'm going to cook it for you. Now he cooked it, he wanted the recipe. We talked a little about the one. When he left, he forgot the recipe. He called me up several times, more concerned that he forgot the Crab cake recipe than would I didn't have you in the movie. <laughs> that said something. Well, and then when I was in Godfather, he said, said, "Well, I made the recipe. I didn't have you right, but I made it. And it was just, it was it was as good as you were." I said, "No, it wasn't." <laughs> <laughs> but I'll give it to him someday. And then Apocalypse Now came later. Didn't well, it? that was after Godfather too, but it was oh, before. Yeah, later. yeah, exactly. I worked on that for like six weeks, and then came back six months later to finish the first half. I mean, it was really because Brando came in. It was the typhoons came. But that, that was interesting, working in the Philippines. That was, that was quite interesting. Your relationship journey. with Francis is good? I guess. You know, I, 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 I haven't seen him in a while. You know, I mean, uh, why not? I mean, we could work yeah. together again. Why isn't he making films? I think he is, isn't is he? he? I don't know. I, I, mean, you I, don't I see happen to, I I mean, to I like I Dracula. Some people maybe didn't. I, I thought there were some one, wonderful things in Dracula. I mean, maybe, yeah. maybe some of his earlier work is better. I don't know. But uh, a guy like that that's so talented, look out, because around the corner he's gonna come with something someday yeah you bet he's got it to oh, deliver yeah he just i mean when you take it. those two godfathers you take apocalypse now yeah. and then take the conversation with gene hackman with gene it. was so yeah. great well you know those are wonderful films that's just about as good as it gets in some areas and you, how many great scripts have you seen in your life <laughs> i don't know great i don't know it, it, you know it's all so subjective i mean 
We were talking about a terrific script that got made that never wasn't done well, I hear. You know, like Terry Malick, the great director. He used yeah. to be a wonderful writer. Now he's coming back. You see scripts sometimes. Somebody said they want to make every year that certain scripts join the five best films that never get made. Yeah. That some never get made that are really wonderful scripts. But, you know, I think that uh, there's some really good ones around that you, you do see in, for, in some, get, you know, I, I, I love the work of Horton for it. Yeah, just, I do too. Just, Knight, didn't he win a Pulitzer a couple of years ago? Yeah, he did for his play. Yeah. He's just one of, one of the best ever. And uh, he's, he's a good friend and, and, uh, and we've had a wonderful working relationship. Yeah, I mean, you pretty much, you are to him what, you know, Jason Robards is to O'Neill. Well, I, you know, I, I, I find a kinship with his work, and I, and, and I love Horton's work. Yeah, we've done quite a few things together. I remember when we were doing Convicts, he'd sit there like this, and he'd be reading and writing, and I'd say, Horton, can I try it? Oh, Bobby, try whatever you want. And then he'd watch the tape and say, cut, and you go back to reading. And so then we came in one day, I had to sit on a grave and talk about the Convicts, and I said, Horton, we changed the whole thing. I sat on the grave, and I suddenly made believe it was my mother I was sitting on. Because he said, oh, I like that. I changed the whole concept of the scene at that moment through like an improvisation, but it didn't violate his script. And he, he's open to that if it's done well, because he's open to it, like, uh, he's not uh, oh, so overly protective, he can't let it wander in a certain way, so long as his, you know, his, uh, his, uh, his uh, scenes are preserved, you know, within the form. Yeah. Great Santini. Yeah, I, I enjoyed doing it. that. Yeah, I enjoyed yeah. it. Did you draw it all on knowing what the military life was like, knowing and understanding the code? Well, I think so. Some of that sense of being transient once again. You know, I, yeah. uh, we were, tra I, and I still, that's why I don't mind traveling in the film business. I, uh, since I was young, we've always moved. Yeah. And I never grew up with that sometimes wonderful thing of people in cities that have a neighborhood, Roots, same friends. And stuff, yeah. Never had that. But I think some of that, yeah, uh, of moving around, uh, that, that character was different from my father. My father was quiet and more brooding. That guy was more mm -hmm. overt. And when he Your mother was effervescent and, yeah. and passionate. Yeah. In the book, The Great Santini, they talk about when uh, the, 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 uh, a military man comes home from a tour of duty, imperceptibly the, the, the uh, change of commands goes from the wife to the father for the time he's home till he goes back on yeah. duty. Yeah. And my family was never that. My, my mother ran the show all the time. Even when he came back. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. My mother was very strong-willed. Just listen to this. So it, when you think about a career, Beyond The Godfather and Pocklix now and, and The Great Santini. Network, mm -hmm. The Paper, Wrestling Ernest Hemingway, yeah, like Ramblin', you like that one? Yeah, a lot. Richard yeah, Harris. Yeah, like it was that. Richard Harris who I was talking about, who yeah. acted with James Earl Jones and another, <laughs> who was talking about how they sort of, yeah, you know. I loved that movie and I liked it also. Why'd you love it? I love that character, that cute old Cuban guy. Yeah. Oh, I love that character. And I, I like working in Rambling Rose, because there's another wonderful writer, and, and Martha Coolidge, like, and two, two lady directors, some woman rights director said, Bobby Duvall working with women directors. I loved it. Working in, uh, you know, Rambling... Well, they thought you were too tough, you were well, too... no, what? women, I, I don't mind being directed by it, as long as they have talent. I mean, you know, like, uh, with, uh, with uh, Martha Coolidge in, in uh, Rambling Rose, it was like a motherly uh, presence behind the camera. Yeah. Yeah. And with Randa Haynes behind the camera, it was like a, a very intelligent, somewhat neurotic sister behind the camera. You know? <laughs> She's very, they're both very, you know, talented ladies. Yeah. Now, do you have a reputation for being tough, demanding, uh, perfectionist? Well, I, I like things to go right. I mean, I, I, I've had my moments on film with directors, but I think a lot of people do. I try not to make it an indulgent thing, I, and hopefully it doesn't become that. Whenever you have conflicts, it's hopefully for the betterment of the film. Yeah, you fight for principle as you see it. Yeah, I mean, on, sometimes on the spot things flare up, but you know, and then they calm down, and uh, but I think it's all part of the work process. Yeah. I've worked with actors who, who tend to sabotage the thing. It's, it can't be to sabotage the project, it can only be to help it. Help sabotage it. it on purpose? Yeah, I, I, work in one, I won't m mention names, but in one instance, it, it, was, it was like sabotaging the project. Well, that would seem to me, if you were on the project, you'd be a little PO'd about that. Well, but you, you got to be careful how you handle it. Somebody will quit, you know. I just wanted to get yeah. through that experience. It was a strange and move experience. On. But, you know, even if sometimes, you know, if it's, you know, if things become a little difficult, it's for the betterment of the project, not, not to be detrimental. Ha have any of your projects been just collecting a paycheck, mm. not because you really... Perhaps. Perhaps. I try to make it not that, but maybe that's... Some you're more, you know, emotionally involved with than others, you know. I mean, I, I would have to say my favorite part of all time is Lonesome Dove. I would think so. Yeah. Why? Is it you? 
Well, you know, when I met Larry McMurtry years ago, he said I should play Colonel Call, and a lot of people said that. They offered me Call. So I said to my agent, look, you have a good working relationship with James Garner. He was going to play uh, Gus. I said, if you call him up, you handle him. And he switches parts, I'll be in this project. Otherwise, I won't. Because my wife, I was separated. They'd already time. given it to him. Well, they had offered. Yeah. said he... I played parts like Gus on stage, but not in the film. More and more muted. And, and, but the people that knew me the best said, no, you're more like Gus. Well, even the author said I should play Call. So I said, he said, I'll get on the phone. So he got on the phone. Four hours later, he called me. He said, James cannot do this part because he can't be on a horse. He has a bad back. Bye -bye. I said, well, go after the other part. Otherwise, I don't want to be in the movie because I've done that part before. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, Tommy Lee was wonderful, but Tommy was good for that. But I wanted to play this other guy because a certain part of me that, that could play that people hadn't seen. Maybe more in theater. So, uh, you know, some, some, somebody says, when is going to be another Lonesome Dove? I said, not for another hundred years. This character is like Shakespeare, I think. Go I on. said, let, let the English play Hamlet in, in, in King Lear. That's wonderful. I'll play Augustus McRae. I mean, he's like a modern-day knight. Well, an 1860, 80s knight by horseback, saving women, loving women, loving life. I mean, he's a very indigenous guy to, to our culture and, and Texas culture which Texas is yeah. like a separate country anyway. But you saw yourself in that character. Yeah, I did. You know, I felt that sense do, of passion I, for yeah. life, your obsession with things yeah. that... And it was such good writing, it could draw you along. And I, and, and I, and I went out in the final... I did research, not a lot. The final person I saw, something told me to go. I went out and found Sammy Ball, the old quarterback of the Washington Redskins. Oh, yeah. And just the way he gestured. Right. <laughs> I remember Sammy Ball. Yeah, to this day, I don't think he knows who I was. We went out and saw him. And he's 70 years he old. Gestured. Just the way he gestured, and I see how he threw a pass. And, yeah. and somehow I got these gestures from this guy. We said goodbye to him and shook hands. And I, I still don't think he, he knew who we were, really. Yeah. It was way out in the middle of nowhere in Texas. But he was 70 years old. Like a, He was like a Texas Ranger. Straight as an arrow, still a warrior, you know, as an ex-football player. Why wouldn't that be? Why wasn't that made into a feature film rather than for television? I don't know. I guess they figured, and, and maybe in a way it's better because you couldn't make it. It'd be hard it, to make an eight-hour yeah, film. Yeah. And that way, it was another thing could develop that character over those four episodes was a wonderful luxury because you couldn't do that in a feature film. And you know, and I think now I'm gonna, I would have gone off, off, off Broadway to play that part. But I think that television was the place for that, or at least from a selfish point of view. Yeah. Developing that character. To really get Absolutely. time you to do it inhabit the hours. character. Yeah. yeah. Stalin. Yeah. You said once, you can't play evil. You have to play behavior. I think so, yeah. That was the hardest thing I've ever done. Tough just going over there, everything. Like somebody said, you're going out on history in an anthropological way as an American playing a Russian in a Russian country, you know. And it was very difficult. It, it, uh, it was, but I enjoyed the experience in a strange way. I know it was had it had mi mixed acceptance, and somebody said, "Why did you use accents?" I said, "Well, why?" Did, it was an English guy. I said, "Well, why do you English play in, in that thing with Sean Connery? All the Russian admirals have English accents. I mean, why shouldn't I give some hint to, of believability to that? You know, and and I know some people liked it, some didn't like it. But you know, like I was told, and I didn't know he was still living, the senior Mikhailkov, Nikita Mikhailkov's father was like six foot eight. He was Stalin's personal poet. Yeah. He's about 88 years old now. And he told Ivan Pasha that he said that I touched the soul of Stalin. So I'm going to believe then rather than the Washington Post or now, some, what of, these, is it some of these periodicals yeah. who really don't know anything about acting or, you know, I'm going to believe that more than I am the negative. Yeah. I'd be in trouble if, if, if the reverse were true. He said I was terrible, and these certain other people in these periodicals. The, the critics loved it, and, and people some who did, knew some Stalin did. said you didn't get it, then you feel exactly. worse. Exactly. And if this guy said that, that, that was like a very touching thing. Do you thing know what he meant when he said that? Do you know what it was about your performance I don't, I don't that, know. that I don't know somehow that. for them said yeah. that's Stalin? I don't know. I, I just know that uh, it's tough to play in those miniseries because a lot of time you're playing history. Yeah. There's a lot of speeches where you end up playing history. You end up playing just. A, a kind of a verbal thing. I, I, I do feel that the final scene with my daughter and that I've, that's as good as I've ever done because a lot of it was half improvised. I've made up stuff and it just went a certain way that was I felt was very ru Russian because uh, there was an Armenian actor that said to me, when you play this part, I don't know what this means to this day, but yet I do know what it means. He says, remember the East, that Oriental thing. Yeah. So it meant nothing to me, yet it meant something. Somehow, I, somehow that meant something to me. And in that final scene, it all worked. Now, maybe other scenes didn't work as well, but I think I, 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 maybe in that scene I captured something that would make Mikhail Kof say that. 
Do you understand anything about his meanness? I mean, his evil? <sighs> no, I, you know, I just finished playing uh, Eichmann. Eichmann. Which is well, my company, the Little Butcher's yeah. one with uh, right. TNT, with a wonderful company to work with. A little easier than HBO. I don't mean to get into politics right. here, but uh, Turner's outfit and uh, Billy Graham directing. Wallace Howard, wonderful actor, played yeah. Malkin. And, uh, and you play Adolf Eichmann. Adolf Eichmann. And, and the, like, like the writer said, which is so right, you know, you can't, from his, I can't play evil. He doesn't think of himself as evil, so I can't play that. I have to play a guy that goes to work every day, drinks water, talks to a to an intelligent talk show host <laughs> and comes into a city from Virginia. You know, it's yeah. the same kind of thing as Stalin, same thing as Eichmann. He, from his point of view, except maybe on a certain night, he doesn't think of himself yeah. as evil. But here, what's interesting about this character is that you got all those interviews that have been published with Eichmann. You remember? And when he, they went in there and there's a guy who was part of the Israeli right. Department of Justice. Yes. So we interviewed him. And interviewed him and interviewed him and they got all this stuff because I've never read, read never some got of, any kind of never guilt. Yeah, it was all not only following orders but it was the law of the land. So therefore, uh, he's a strange guy. Did you but, understand him at all? I mean, can you understand somebody who's once part again, of the enormity once, of that? Once again, no. Genocide. So a lot of people say a lot of people in that position would have done the same. A lot wouldn't have. Look at look at Watergate on a much less yeah, yeah. scale. I mean, trivial by comparison. That the guys that that bailed out bailed out and the others who didn't went to jail. So there's some point maybe the consequences would be too big, big if they bailed out within that Nazi uh, syndrome of government. I don't know. But uh, from his point of view he's not evil and from Stalin's point of view he's not evil. So they were just they were just doing their duty so to speak. Let me talk a little bit as we close about your obsessions. Horses. <laughs> <laughs> I know hobbies become obsessions and you try to do them as well as you do your profession sometimes you can't but you try Harless Howard called me uh, several years ago and said what do you do when you're a young actor in between jobs I said there's three things hobbies hobbies and more hobbies keeps you off of dope it keeps you out of trouble right. keeps you yeah. hopefully on the straight and narrow you try to go after a hobby with as much passion and, and, and well, that's you what do I'm getting at. so horses and you learn you did everything with horses yeah, yeah. and you in fact come back to it because yeah. and and you also were had an accent very similar to what happened to Christopher yeah, Reed. I, did. I flipped my horse flipped Fino I saw the horse for a lot it was named after the best tango dancer I ever saw, Fino. <laughs> hey, and he won a big Grand Prix in Ireland and uh, made, made a lot of money off him. But before that, when I used to exercise him, we did one over a small series of jumps. The horse flipped. I flipped, hit on my head. Several days later, I rode in a little horse show locally. And then that night, I got a massage, which I think you're not supposed to do. And the, for the next few weeks, it was pretty I was uncomfortable sleeping. But fortunately, it was not like what, what he went through. Yeah. And I hope that he recovers as quickly as possible. Tennis. You went tennis, obsessed yeah. about tennis, and, and, and the story is, is that you not only did you play though, you went to tennis late. I mean, you were yeah, middle I, age. I, I you, was about thirty-five, six. Yeah, thirty-five, I start, six. You yeah, were, and you became you started winning celebrity tournaments. You got I that won good. some. I won some and doubles. Yeah, doubles. Yeah, Ronnie Holmberg and I beat uh, Chuck McKinley when he was over the hill and a uh, guy that was two hundredth right? in the world. So we, Ronnie Holmberg beat him. played a lot of Ronnie tennis, was a yeah. good friend of mine. And he held, he said, "Come on, there, come on, there, press the net, press the net." You know, he coached, and we we did pretty good. But uh, I was okay. I wasn't the best in showbiz. I was one of the best. Who's the best? Do you think? Well, Dabney, I think Coleman was. Dabney Coleman was really. Yeah, he was. I beat him in doubles, but not in single. But he he played all his life. He's and when you play against another yeah. actor, you're going to put. And the, 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 the guy who was in Eight is Enough, the Brady. Well, no, the best of all was uh, was the kid. He was uh, he beat Magno twice in six months. Vinny Van Patten. Yeah, Van Patten. Well, that, was another, that, was an, that was another level. That whole family is obsessed by Yeah, Vinny was, uh, you know, if he'd have even stuck to it more, he's a wonderful, that kid could do anything. Yeah. Right, he could do anything. He's a wonderful athlete. Tango. Uh, uh. <laughs> you know, once again, you, you try to do things when you get older that you, you know, if you were younger, I think I'd had a really great crack at that. You know, I, I've at written, being a tango dancer? Well, you know, club dancer, not professional. You know, I do okay. I mean, so what is it about it, though? For you well it's just something that it's just I can't explain it it's you know without being I don't want to be pretentious or, or whatever I just I like it very much I like it only the way they do it in the clubs in Argentina the Milonga not the professional not the choreograph I've written a script on it. I'm gonna do it in several years All right, now come connected more, you, to two cities New York and Buenos Aires yeah. should be underworld now you have to, don't you have a tango dancer that you in, in the I event? brought a guy up with me great guy <laughs> Nestor uh, Salvatore uh, Ryan or he's, so he's, he's teaching Who's well, he, he's teaching classes in my barn. Before I uh, yeah. split with my wife, we built yeah. a beautiful barn. We had to sleep at the wheel play. It's a, it's a wonderful place. So he's up 
giving clinics in Tango. His wife came up today. Yeah. And you're getting better and better yeah, and better. Yeah, and better. We were, you know, it's like, you know, when you start late on something, but it's something I have a good feel for. And it's like, like you know, physically, I have to warm up because I can't, you know, I want, maybe I think I have to take up a little yoga to get more limber. But, you know, like, I have a good feel for it. I'm, I'm a, what they call a meal on Garrow. I, you know, I can hold my own. I mean, like club dancer. And this guy, he's a wonderful guy, so I get a little better. And then and Danella, the love it. yeah, Danella Maria, also people here who teach. You know, I only go to, I only hang out with Argentines to learn what, because it's an ethnic thing. They don't dance it, they walk it. It's a certain way they walk. And the Americans, when they learn the tango, do not want to learn the walk. They want to get the Americans sometimes they want to get to the fancy stuff, and it's just there's a simplicity about it. It's very nice. But you know, I, I just like it. I just you know, try to get a little better and a little better and enjoy something. If you have an obsession, you try to enjoy it, too, on the best days. <laughs> it's great to have you here. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Robert Vaughn.